When Helen and Bill and I talked about this talk uh, a month and a half or two months ago, I got excited because it was about. Sorry. Yep. I got to get you. Oh, um, I got excited because it was talking about a course that I took in grad school called Science to Solutions, and I'm going to use that phrase in a moment. Um, but how do we get from the science that Ming just talked about to the actual policy changes and decision, change, decision making that you all are, are trying to uh, work every day? And so my professor is really excited about this talk, um, and I am too, because it's kind of the world that I like to straddle. I was trained as a scientist in undergrad, and then in graduate school really wanted to figure out how do we get that science into action. So here we go. Um, as Helen said, um, the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy helped start the Eastern Shore Climate Adaptation Partnership. It is uh, a partnership, regional partnership, uh, aim at climate resilience. Um, that features participation from six counties on the mid and upper shore that correspond to Eastern Shore Land Conservancy's service area footprint. Um, and then we have great involvement from some of our state agencies and the academic institutions around the state um, and the region. We're close to DC, so we've got a lot of great partners coming from there as well. Um, and then it's um, a really great mix of planning and emergency management and public health. So we were sort of bringing all of these pieces together with the science to try to make some solid decisions. The project I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, one that we kicked off just in January. It's called Mainstreaming Sea Level Rise Preparedness into Local Planning on Maryland's Eastern Shore. And the idea is to get from the science to the actual policy changes and the language of the policy changes that could be made based on that science. Then, of course, it's up to the communities and the political process to make sure that those get through. But we're going to try to get the ball all the way to um, the actual language changes that would be required. We know you guys are all busy. Climate change is something that can be viewed at as way out there in the future and that you've got other things on your plates. The schools need to be rebuilt and the zoning needs to be redone. You've got other timelines that are important to you. So part of what we're thinking about with this project is how can we provide as much of the workload uh, through the project as possible to get it to that place where it's just about teed up to go to decision makers. We'll see if that works. <laughs> um, the ultimate goal with this, with this project is to produce some sea level rise planning scenarios, taking a look at 2050 and 2100. Um, work those backwards to um, ways that we can influence planning processes that you guys already work with. So floodplain management and capital investment planning are the two that we're really going to look at with this project. I'm sure that it can be applied to a number of other, pro other processes that you guys are working on. And the geography there that we're working with, we're doing this project for Caroline, Cecil, Dorchester, Queen Anne's, and Talbot County. Kent County's mapping was completed uh, two years ago, and then we'll be able to pick up with the, some of the policy work there as well. So we're following the science to solutions um, format with the project, and we're starting with the science. Um, the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative at Salisbury University is doing a lot of the GIS mapping, producing the sea level change scenarios that we're going to be using. They are modeling this off of the Army Corps' data for sea level rise, and there's some considerations for why they chose that data set and not another one. Um, and if you have questions about that, I can try to answer it, or I can direct you to Mike Scott, who can answer it for sure. Um, but he's downscaling that work from the Army Corps to look specifically at the projections for the five counties I listed on the eastern shore to the point where there are slight differences in the sea level rise projections for each of those five counties. And there are a number of reasons that he can detail about why it's different from Dorchester up to Cecil. And it's, it's small, it's in inches, it's not huge, but it's significant enough that he's getting very specific to county level data. We want to take that sound science and filter it through a local process so that we get the flavor of what's important to a community, what are the values, what are the priorities, what are the communities observing? What do they know is going on? What do they suspect is going on that they need some data to prove? And then work through the process with them so that the data gets translated and interpreted according to what's important to the community. And this is, I think, probably the most important step in the process is that we're not just telling a community this is what the science says, this is what you need to do. It's this is what the science said, it's backing up what you're seeing, and now you get to decide what it is we should do. 
that step is going to take place uh, next month through a series of workshops that we're running uh, in the middle of May with the communities. Uh, and I can get into a deeper um, description of that if you're interested. Um, needless to say, it's several half-day workshops uh, of community engagement, uh, primarily with folks like you who are in the planners, emergency managers, um, decision makers, planning commission folks like that. From those workshops, we are going to summarize what we learn and then produce the technical guidance necessary to make the policy changes that the group decides on. Um, we're pulling in subject matter experts to write these policy guidance. We're going to use the Georgetown Climate Center to write um, policy guidance for updating uh, floodplain management codes and ordinances. And we're going to use the Environmental Finance Center to write a piece about how to incorporate these sea level rise projections into capital investment planning. So they are going to take a look at some case studies of what's been done, perhaps in other places in Maryland, other places around the country. But they're going to write specific language for each of the jurisdictions in the partnership to make those code changes or to make the planning process changes that are necessary. And of course, it'll be up to the communities to modify that language to make it appropriate for them. Um, but we're trying to get the ball as far down the field as possible so there's as little um, work that needs to be done on the ground in the communities as possible, while at the same time we're taking as much community input into the process as possible. Then the last bit of it is you've got to go out and do it. All right? we've, we've got the information, we've got the guidance, now we need to go forward and make the policy or planning changes. So we're going to have trainings based on all of the process and the products that we're producing here. We're doing workshops. We've started some of those already as far as the GIS workshop we just held this past Wednesday that was both mind-blowing and enlightening at the same time. For those, there's a couple <laughs> folks in the room who were there, and it was really fantastic. In incidentally, what some of that um, research has started to show already is that floodplain management works. If you have strong floodplain management, um, it is already buying you time to make uh, further decisions. But there is an uh, expiration date on the effectiveness of current floodplain management. Um, and so one of the policy changes we think could come out of this project is changing the um, extent of the floodplain that's managed and make it less about lines on a FEMA map and more about lines that are dictated by the science. Um, so there's some excitement building around the possibility of floodplain management that is informed by these sea level rise projections. Uh, and then I'll just reiterate the importance of, for our region anyway, of working at this regional scale on multi-level partnerships. We've got multiple jurisdictions working together, nobody sticking their neck out too far all at once. Um, and we're able to produce this work, particularly the work from Salisbury University, much more cost effectively when we do it for five counties than when we try to do it individually for five counties. So we're recognizing some cost efficiencies in the process as well. So what do we hope to deliver to communities from the project? There'll be a pretty robust GIS analysis um, showing baseline sea level rise, the 1% and the 0.2% chance flooding in 2015 gives us an understanding of where we are. And then projections of sea level rise and the 1% 100-year flood in 2050 and 2100 for each community. For each of those scenarios, we're going to have uh, tabular data of the number of structures in each community that is flooded uh, and the cumulative value of damage from those flood events. There's a number of assumptions that go into that, um, which we can dig into later on if you're interested. But it will give communities a dollar figure uh, for the amount of damage that can be expected under uh, these scenarios. Uh, information that mostly already exists uh, through a project with State Highway that's just about completed is the length and number of inundated road segments for all of these counties. Uh, I think all of the coastal counties in Maryland have that data now from Salisbury, so that's accessible to you guys. Um, and then we just did the GIS training for county and town staff this past Wednesday, and there'll be some more of that going on as well. So that's all the GIS deliverables. Uh, we have these participatory workshops where people get to engage with the data, learn about it, manipulate it, figure out what that data means for their community looking forward and how they can plan, um, how they can incorporate that data into their decision-making processes and what it really means for the future of the community, what the solutions are. 
Uh, and then, as I said, we'll produce these policy guidance documents for updating uh, floodplain management to higher standards based on the science, um, updating how we do capital investment planning. So if you're building new pieces of infrastructure, wastewater treatment plant, um, are there codified uh, steps in the decision-making process that say we need to incorporate what sea level rise is going to be in 50 years if the lifespan of that wastewater treatment plant is 75 years? It makes sense to plan that way. And then the training and outreach to not just the planners and the staff level folks who need to make that happen, but also to their elected leaders who ultimately need to make the decision on it. So that, I believe, is the scope of our project. It's ambitious. It'll be done by the end of the year. Um, and it'll be in your hands at the end of the year, yeah, Helen. Well, thank you very much. Right after the election. Right, right after the right election, after exactly. The election. Yeah, perfectly timed. Thank you. Any quick questions to Brian? Hi. Yes. You said what data sets will be available to all traffic? Are these coastal counties in Maryland or just something? No, coastal counties in Maryland. The data set from the State Highway Administration's work on road inundation. And, and, okay. And that includes storm surge and sea level rise. Same. Is it? I believe. And is it, mo That's a is good it question. the same model that? Yes, yeah, same model. That Mike's done using for this? Yes. And that's how we were able to save money at taking tapping on that right. model, right? So, Brad, see I believe they did. Kate, do you know? Yeah. So they did storm surge as well. They did. Um, so they did the one percent, the point two percent, the ten percent chance floods, all of that. I believe. Yeah. For most counties, it's completed. There may be a couple that it's not. So they've been releasing each county as it becomes available, right? So I think Talbot is already done, Martin. Yeah. 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 All that's done. I think Dorchester is one of the later ones because it's so big and has so much flooding, but most of them are done by this point, I think. Yeah. Is this uh, partnership, is it created just for that new project, or do you have like, other projects that you will continue doing after? Yeah, so we hope to do a lot more projects like this through the partnership. Um, other things that we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the community rating system uh, and ways that we can help communities with that, either by providing support or doing collaborative projects for the community rating system. I would love to do a very similar project to this one, looking at extreme precipitation and changes in rainfall and how uh, infrastructure would be affected by that. Um, so yeah, we, we're cooking a number of other projects. Yes, ma'am. How are these types of projects funded? Uh, this one is funded through uh, a new foundation called the Climate Resilience Fund. I think they're based in California. Uh, so we've got a two-year grant for that. That's the last one. Either a park project or new is has just related to stormwater management in these areas. Right. So um, I think where it could fall in is uh, in the capital investment planning for one is you're, you're planning new stormwater infrastructure, making sure that it's sized appropriately for the flows that you might expect in the future. Um, we have not uh, scoped as part of this project looking at stormwater management ordinances or things like that. Um, particularly because this is a coastal flooding project. It's not looking at precipitation-driven flooding. And that's the one, I think, in the future, where if we can get find funding to do a precipitation-type project similar to this, we'd absolutely be looking at the stormwater infrastructure. Yep. Thanks very much, Brian. Thank We're going to take a quick break.